annual Lemon Project Spring Symposium. My name is Jody Allen and I'm the Robert Francis Ings, the rector of the Lemon Project. And we're so excited um, that you're here to join us um, today. Before we begin, I'd like to share the um, following land acknowledgement statement with you. William and Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Cherenhaka, Nottaway, the Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Mattapanai, the Monacan, the Nansman, the Nottaway, the Pamunkey, the Patawomek, the Upper Mattapanai, and Rappahannock tribes and pay our respect to their tribal members past and present. Also, the Lemon Project stands with the rest of William and Mary in solidarity with our Asian and Asian Pacific Islander colleagues and students to say that anti-Asian hate is unacceptable and has no place at William and Mary. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn over um, the mic, so to speak, to Dr. Susan Kern, the Executive Director of the Historic Campus, who will moderate our first panel, Women and Slavery. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you. Uh Dr. Allen, uh, and thank you for your leadership in uh, getting to the 11th Annual Lemon Project Spring Symposium. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure to have been part of this and to see how this has grown uh, and how the themes challenge us every year to think in, in different ways about uh, slavery and race and William and Mary and what our role is with that. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, all of the participants in the symposium, uh, invite you to use the chat feature of Zoom to ask any questions you have for our panelists. Uh, there's a group of uh, our facilitators who will collect the questions and feed them to, to me to ask of the panelists at the end of the session. So what I'm going to do is introduce all of our panelists uh, and then they will go in the order they are in in the program uh, and, um, uh, and then we'll take their questions after. So our first speaker today is Elsa Mendoza uh, and her talk is entitled Only God and Trusty Black Women, The Life and Labor of Enslaved Women at Georgetown University and the Jesuit Plantations in Maryland. Elsa Mendoza is a PhD candidate in history at Georgetown University and the assistant curator of the Georgetown Slavery Archive, an online repository of documents related to the Jesuit slaveholding in Maryland. She is currently working on a dissertation titled Catholic Slaveholding and the Origins of Jesuit Higher Education. Our second speaker will be Candace Gray. Uh, talking about collective defense uh, and, and the Chickasaw affair uh, in um, 1836. Candace Gray is an ABD student at Morgan State University in African American history. Her dissertation is entitled Slavery, Race and Women's Rights in the Supreme Court of Texas, 1823 to 1923 and reflects her graduate work in cultural and, cultural and legal history studies. After completion of her PhD, she hopes to continue to emphasize her work in legal and social histories from 19th century American history while writing for future long and short term publication projects. Uh, Caroline Watson uh, is uh, will be speaking today on a history of archaeological work at William and Mary. Uh, she's currently working on her MA in, Ar in historical archaeology at William and Mary, where she works in the Society Islands, French Polynesia, where she studies the impact of religion and ideology on monumental architecture and settlement patterns. She's also served as the anthropology graduate research fellow to the Lemon Project since fall of 2019. So, Elsa, uh, you are our spe first speaker today, uh, and I turn the mic over to you. And again, reminder to our participants to use the chat feature in Zoom to, to type in any questions you have uh, for the speakers, which we will bring uh, at, at, at the end of all of our their presentations this morning. Thank you. 
Hi, thank you all for being here today, especially during lunchtime. Uh, today I will be speaking to you about the experiences of women who were enslaved at Georgetown University's campus. Now, during the first days of 1816, Father Giovanni Grassi, who was the head of the Jesuit mission in Maryland, received troubling reports from St. Inigo's plantation. A white woman had been engaged as a servant for the priest's household. In response to these rumors, Father Grassi wrote to the offending priest, Father Joseph Marshall, to inform him of his unacceptable arrangement. He reminded him that, and I quote from a letter, the servants in the Jesuit house are always black women. White women had no place in the Jesuit household. Grassi reminded Marshall that, and I quote, only God and trusty black women were always found to keep the keys of their houses. In seven plantations in Maryland in a college in Washington, DC, the labor of black women who were enslaved took many forms. They cared for ailing priests and students. They were cooks and laundresses and maids. They cleaned churches and classrooms. Their work made the operations of the Jesuit missions possible. In churches that like priests, for example, they became sacristans who assisted in Jesuit daily masses. Women were housekeepers in all of the Jesuit households. And they also picked cotton and corn in plantations alongside men. They attended also to gardens and fields. Nonetheless, women remain nearly imperceptible in the multiple works on Jesuit slaveholding in the region. Historians have only studied the Jesuits and slave community in the aggregate. They have focused on institutions, given prominence to the organizational history of plantations, of colleges, and religious orders. And as a result, all of these studies are genderless, faceless, and nameless. Now, the following presentation will examine the experiences of displacement, separation from their families, sale, abuse, and extenuating and physically demanding labor of women who were enslaved by the Jesuits. I will center in particular on the lives of three women who were enslaved at Georgetown's campus. Their names were Polly, Harriet Edelin, and Margaret Smallwood. Now, the first one that I'm going to speak to you about is Polly. Polly arrived at Georgetown College in Washington, D.C. in 1804. Sacramental records from Charles County, Maryland suggest that at the time she was 23 years old. She was brought to the school by her enslaver, a man named Charles Foreman, who had been hired by the school's leaders to become a professor at the college. Now, according to a certificate of slaves that Borman registered with the city's recorder of deeds, he brought into the city of Washington 10 enslaved people as he relocated from Charles County, Maryland. Their names were Lewis, Sam, Terry, Nellie, Polly, Suki, and three enslaved children named David, Polly, and Rachel. These three infants were Polly's children and their ages were four, two, and one years old. Now Polly labored at Georgetown's campus and I'm gonna share uh, my screen with you. She, she labored at Georgetown's campus as a laundress for at least two years. On screen, what you see is an account from Charles Borman's sons in which it shows that part of the proceeds of Polly's labor helped finance the education of Charles Borman's children, Charles, Courtney, and George Borman. These types of arrangements where the labor of an enslaved Black woman helped finance the education of white boy were common, especially in the first years of Georgetown College. While at the school, Polly, whose labor was credited to help finance the education of these boys, was actually separated from her children her children who had arrived in the city of Washington with her. These three children were sent to board with a white slave holding woman who resided close to Georgetown's campus. Her name was Margaret Fenwick. 
Mrs. Fenwick was a parishioner at Georgetown's church and a close acquaintance of the school's leaders. Uh, three of her sons, for example, were Jesuit priests who eventually became leaders at the school. At her house, Fenwick boarded enslaved people that were sent there by the Jesuits, and she also boarded students from the college. Uh, at that time, she was boarding Polly's children, and Georgetown College paid for the boarding of these infants, which suggests that actually the separation between mother and children had been done at the behest of Georgetown College since the institution was financing it. Now, Benwick lived close to campus, which might suggest that Polly at some point might have been able to see her children, perhaps while she was walking on the street. Benwick lived two blocks away from campus. Perhaps on Sundays, you know, uh, Polly might have seen them on the street or visited with them. However, in her everyday life, she was actively separated from her infants by her enslaver and mentor as she laundered the clothes of priests and students at the school. Now, enslaved laundresses washed the clothes of students and priests in the river, which is in the vicinity of campus. And while washing clothes, they were exposed to the insalubrity of the region and many illnesses. Enslaved laundresses like Polly also frequently made soap with lye, which often left them with chemical burns in their hands. Now, the majority of the women who were enslaved on Georgetown's campus were laundresses who were exposed to this artist's work, working by hand, washing in polluted waters the garments of at least 62 students and six priests. Doing laundry involved washing, rinsing, drying, and ironing. It was a chore done in a period of days. And one of the women that in the 1820s were, was a laundress at the school was Harriet Edelin. Edelin began laboring in slavery at the school in the early 1820s. She had been enslaved all of her life by Margaret Fenwick, the same woman who at some point had boarded Polly's children. The Fenwicks were a prominent Catholic family in Maryland, and they were prominent uh, benefactors of Georgetown College. Uh, Edelin's enslaver during the 1820s was a woman with strong connections with the Catholic Church. And on average, Margaret Fenwick received $3 for Harriet Edelin's slaver. Edelin remained at the school at Georgetown from 1820 to 1829. She lived in slavery at Georgetown's campus for nine years, washing the clothes of students. There are records that she attended Holy Trinity Church and that she paid troop uh, uh, pew rents at that church. However, Harriet Edelin's life changed completely when Margaret Fenwick passed away in 1829. Just as many men and women, her life changes changed when her enslaver passed away. In the case of Harriet Edelin, what happened to her was that she became the property of one of Margaret Fenwick's sons, George Fenwick, who was actually a professor at Georgetown College. And George Fenwick decided to sell Harriet Edelin to a person that lived close by in the neighborhood to the Johnsons for $210. The letter that you see on the screen was a letter that preceded the arrangement in which uh, Fenwick sold uh, Harriet Edelin. This letter reveals part of the conditions in which women were enslaved on campus. As for example, the letter shows that at the time of her sale, Harriet Edelin only had with her one pair of shoes and one dress with her, and that she had been in that state since Margaret Fenwick had passed away. She was sold in 1830 and Margaret Fenwick passed away in 1829. So for a whole year at least, Harriet Edelin lived in these conditions. So Ariana Johnson wrote to Father Fenwick suggesting or rather demanding an adjustment in the price of sale since she would have been forced to buy new furnishings for Harriet Edelin. At the end, 
George Fenwick decided to adjust the price of sale of Edelin because of the conditions in which he sold her. And the proceeds of the sale benefited Georgetown College since George Fenwick deposited in the school's treasury. Now, sales were not the only tragedies experienced by women at the school. As I mentioned to you, the insalubrity of the region and the fact that they were all laundresses exposed them to many illnesses, like for example, yellow fever, malaria. And infirmary records reveal, for example, that many of them received Peruvian bark, which was a way in which to treat malaria at the time. The conditions were so harsh that some women also passed away while they were laboring at the college. One of them was Margaret Smallwood, whose death records I will share with you on the screen now. Margaret Smallwood was a laundress at the school during the 1830s. She appears in church records as a parishioner at Holy Trinity Church. She does not appear often in the school's financial records, which suggests that she was actually owned and enslaved by the Jesuit order. But she was a constant presence in church records. And on April 21st of 1837, at the age of 45, Margaret Smallwood, who was a laundress at the school and who had received on multiple occasions ointments for burns in her hands, passed away. The record of her burial describes her as wife to a Charles Smallwood and, and I quote, as belonging to Georgetown College. Now, on the day of her passing, the Jesuit who kept the house diary also made an annotation of her death, describing how she passed away after an illness that she, that she patiently bore, and that she passed away after receiving the last rites of the Catholic Church. Now, the last moments of Margaret Smallwood's life and her existence of, in documents, what we know about her, was marked by the institution of slavery. As the schools described her as property of the college when making the annotation of her death, her status as an enslaved woman followed her in death. Now, the lives of these three women were marked by physically demanding labor, by displacement, in the case of Polly, by the separation from her families. In the case of Harriet Ellen, by sales and Margaret Smallwood found her own timely demise at the school. But there are aspects from women's lives that still remain a mystery to us about their everyday activities, their family lives, and also goes without saying the violence that they might have survived in plantations and at the school. Now, limited sources do not reveal any details about how women endured slavery. We do not know their voices from their archival record. But we do know that Catholic priests who led Georgetown had a contentious relationship with the women that they enslaved, that, that their plantations women receipts resisted and sued them from wrongful enslavement in Maryland courts to try and gain their freedom, that some women actually fled the school, that they run away, there were also rampant rumors that priests kept enslaved women as concubines. For example, one of Georgetown's founders, a man named George a a John Ashton, was sued by three women for rampant enslavement. And he was also rumored to have fathered three children with an enslaved woman named Susanna Queen. These rumors only increased after his death, as in his will, he left part of his properties to Queen and her children. Now, letters from Maryland plantations and records sent to Rome also suggest that Jesuits beat women, including pregnant women, by whipping them in their bedrooms. A story that became common knowledge in the 1820s and that I will share with you 
one of the evidence on the screen, was that of a woman named Suki, who in her last years confided to a recently arrived European priest that in her youth, she had witnessed a priest who had self-flagellated himself and that terrified, she looked through the window and she entered the room trying to stop him from hurting himself. But that, to her surprise, the priest instead decided to punish her, giving her, in Suki's words, according to the priest, what she described as, and you can see it on the green highlight on the screen, a dreadful whipping for her curiosity. Now, reports of abuses such as the one that Suki received became so common in the 1820s that a Jesuit from Rome visited Maryland to review the matter, reporting that sometimes, and I quote, women had been tied up in the priest's parlor where they were punished. Father Kenny also published a series of regulations for all Jesuit households, including Georgetown University, that insisted that pregnant women should not be whipped, that women should not be undressed when punished by priests, and that they should not live and sleep in the same rooms as priests. Now, we might not be able to find many traces of these events in the archive, but the fact that these regulations had to be implemented make it highly likely that these events were part of the experiences of women enslaved by the Jesuits at their plantations and at Georgetown. And there are many aspects of the lives of these women that still remain a mystery, including how many women were enslaved by the Jesuits and how many of them labored at Georgetown College. At Georgetown and in the Jesuit plantations, women were, sometimes were also hired as day laborers, for example. And in these occasions, the Jesuit priests who recorded in financial records didn't even bother to write their name, which makes it impossible especially nearly impossible to identify the exact number of women that were enslaved at the school or to find what happened to them after they left campus. Now, in conclusion, the women who were enslaved at Georgetown were displaced sometimes from plantations in Maryland. Some of them I have found on records were displaced even from the Caribbean. They were displaced from their homelands. They worked in harsh conditions as laundresses, as cooks, as personal servants. They suffered separation from their families. And in some instances, they lost their lives while laboring in slavery at the school. Complementary records suggest that they suffered abuses, lived in dire conditions in cellar and attics. The lives of women such as Polly, Harriet Edelin, and Margaret Smallwood are of particular importance, especially in this moment, as historians continue to unravel how higher education depended on the enslavement of others, and what are the legacies of this history that live with us to this day. What are the implications of discoveries such as that the labor of Polly, who was separated from her children, the labor at Georgetown, helped finance the education of a young man named Charles Borman, who later in life became a career officer in the U.S. Navy and rose to the rank of rear admiral? What are the legacies of these historical processes and those disparities to this day? How can we trace them? Women were laundresses, cooks, and maids, and it's not fortuitous that Black women realized these activities at the school. Their work was gendered and natured, and it made the operation of the university possible. Just think, the clean clothes the students and priests wore, the buildings they occupied, the classrooms and chapels they filled, the gardens they enjoyed, and the food that they ate were all areas touched by the labor of enslaved women who took care of the school president when he was ill, who handled school provisions, and who in some instance even assisted in church services. The history of Georgetown University as an operated institution is inexplicable without these women. Polly, Harriet Edelin, and Margaret Smallwood and many of them whose names are lost to us are already in the college financial records. And I will share with you some of their names, some of the names that I have found. 
So these women and those names that you see on the screen, they are already in the school's financial records. We will never know their interior thoughts. We will never know their dreams. We will never be able to document all that they lost and that all that they suffered. But the least we can do is to say their names. It is time for them to be part of Georgetown's history as well. You know, Suki, Jenny, Isley, Lucy, Polly, Jane, Anne, Maria, Charity, Suki, Tempe, Buki, and so many others that you see on the screen. They are already there in financial records. There are many others who we will never know about. So as a historian, and it's been the work of the Georgetown Slavery Archive to try and find traces of these women so that they can now be incorporated and we can now know more about their lives. So all that is left to me to do is to thank you for your attention and to invite you as well to visit the page of the Georgetown Slavery Archive if you're interested in knowing more about this history. Uh, the Georgetown Slavery Archive contains most of the documents that I showed you today and many more about the lives of women women who were enslaved at Georgetown and the Jesuit plantations. So thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your questions. Elsa, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Uh, I'm intervening here because we have a slight change in program and Caroline Watson is going to present her paper next. So. Uh, Please enter your questions and great presentation, uh, Elsa Mendoza. Yes, thank you, Elsa. That was an incredibly interesting and fabulous presentation. Um, thank you for coming to the symposium and sharing your research with us. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about the work that I've been doing as the Lemon Project um, graduate assistant for anthropology and archaeology. And let me share my screen with you all really quickly here. Okay. Okay. So I'm Caroline Watson. I am a second year master's student at William and Mary. And as I just mentioned, I'm the anthropology slash archaeology um, graduate research fellow for the Lemon Project. I've worked with the Lemon Project for almost two years now, and this is kind of a summary of some of the work that I've been doing, and in addition, um, some of the work that I hope to do in the future. My role as an archaeologist working with the Lemon Project helps fulfill the Lemon Project's mission to conduct interdisciplinary and um, multifaceted research. I align with the other research the Lemon Project takes on in that I look at archival records to study the history of enslavement at William & Mary. However, the documents that I look at and analyze are specifically archaeological reports. So archaeologists have performed excavations on campus um, for at least 90 years now, and they've shared their findings in published reports. And I've been collecting these reports and looking at the descriptions of their material findings mostly. And that's really the first goal um, of my fellowship. Gather all this documentation, digitize it, get it all into one place. I also hope to create a standardized artifact um, inventory database because there's been different archaeological groups that have been on campus and done work um, artifact data is cataloged and labeled differently. So we hope to be able to standardize all of this and put it into one database and eventually translate all of that um, into this system that's connected to um, a public facing website where people can access this data and engage with this archeological information in the hopes that this will encourage future research projects about specifically related to the materiality of um, enslavement at William and Mary. In this presentation though, I'm gonna focus mostly on my work that is related to goal number one in terms of the reports. So officially, official archeological investigations on William and Mary's campus date back to the early 20th century with the first projects being conducted between 1929 and 1931. These were funded by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and these were mostly restoration projects that dug trenches in order to find 
original brick structures and foundations of the president's house in the Wren building. The map I have here is, is just a visual of some of the early trenching they did. And it also shows, it kind of overlays the fact that there's been a lot of testing done in, in a similar area over the years. Here is a more comprehensive view of all of historic campus. This image really shows the amount of archeological work that's been done on campus. And if you look to the legend, you can see the multiple parties that have been involved in excavation, as well as the different techniques that have been used in terms of trenching versus shovel test pits versus what we know to be the more standard unit excavation. I believe this map reflects somewhere, or somewhere around 20 independent archeological projects that range from wanting to find original brick foundations of the Wren building to wanting to locate the more formal ornamental Wren garden. Archaeological findings at William & Mary have been, they are incredibly diverse. Faunal remains and kitchen ceramics indicate that people lived and worked here. More personal items such as rosary beads, tobacco pipe bowls, and stone marbles suggest that this is also a place where status and identity were expressed and negotiated and where leisure activities occurred. Material remains range from small finds like beads and bullets to larger structural features like brick drains and cisterns. And I've included a few of these findings in the pictures here. Down at the bottom, you have kitchen artifacts um, like this teapot lid, I believe. And then you have larger structural, structural remains such as this brick sump right here. There's also variation in the factors that prompt archeological research. And this is what I'm really gonna focus on. Um, so some projects, some archeological projects took place before construction activities. Um, for instance, when the, um, for the proposed Wren Yard Irrigation Project, archeology span happened to make sure that there wasn't going to be a disturbance of cultural resources. Same thing for the proposed dormitory near the Barksdale Athletic Field. Others were excavations that kind of occurred in response to findings um, or new discoveries that happened during a building re renovation. Um, for instance, I believe there were um, excavations, there was a brick drain brick recovered during in the 1980s in the president's house when people were trying to put in um, an air conditioning system. And to my current knowledge, there are only four projects that have taken place outside of historic campus, and I've labeled them here. Three of them were compliance projects related to the construction of the Mason School of Business and the Barksdale Athletic Field. And those are the three circles at the bottom half of the image. The fourth excavation was over by the Alumni House. If you're familiar with William & Mary's campus, it's, it's the Western boundary of campus near the, um, the football stadium. I'm gonna come back to that project in just a minute. So at this point in my fellowship, I've gathered all of these documents, I'm looking at them, I've gained a pretty solid understanding of the amount of archeological work that William & Mary has commissioned. So now I've turned to ask, okay, how many of these projects focus on the history of enslaved lifeways? Collecting all of these reports and reading through them has emphasized to me that most archeological work on campus was not designed to specifically answer questions about enslavement. To be fair, some, some write-ups briefly allude to enslaved Africans being on campus, yet others fail to acknowledge the presence of enslaved people at all in their write-ups and in their material interpretations. And I've um, laid out some statistics here. So out of 18 archeological independent excavations that have taken place since 1931, only one was specifically prompted by questions about uh, wanting to learn more about African and African-American history on campus. Four out of 29 published archeological reports that I've been able to find consider their material findings within a context of slavery and within the anthropology department, there is one master's thesis that has analyzed excavated material to specifically 
explore questions of enslaved lifeways. Now, that all sounds a little bit critical, and I wanna I wanna take a step back and explain that there are definitely real world understandable constraints to archaeologists. Most archaeological work done on campus has been compliance archaeology. And this is when you get hired to survey an area and make sure there's the construction or the renovation of a building is not going to impact cultural resources. Um, also, I'm mostly working with unpublished reports or I'm mostly working with published reports and the material that I can find and what's been made available to me. It's very possible that there's, there's unpublished work out there or stuff that hasn't been written up yet. And that's what we tend to call gray literature. So going back to the statistics I just presented, some of that may be a little off due to this. And finally, stakeholders. Stakeholders have significant impacts on directing projects. Who is interested in what? who benefits from this excavation, and what kind of pressure is the public putting on William and Mary to maintain historical structures as they are in terms of preservation. So those kinds of questions really direct where the funding goes, and they also direct where archaeologists' time go. But now I do want to turn and highlight a few projects that I've come to be familiar with in my research that I think that I hope you might find interesting. The first is a survey performed by the William and Mary Center for Archaeological Research, or WIMCAR. This was done in 2016, and it was a project that sought to assess the potential of unmarked graves in a 10-acre tract of land that used to sit right on the old college, um, the western boundary near the alumni house. The man who owned this land, Samuel Bright, was a known slaveholder, and historic documents suggested that there were nearby structures on his land that housed enslaved people. So the Wimcar archeologists designed a survey and excavation plan to test this area for any cultural resources in any unmarked graves. Ultimately, these archeologists did not um, find any evidence of unmarked graves. However, they did find some interesting settlement anomalies that they suggested should be further looked at. Even though there was no finding of an enslaved burial ground through this project, I wanted to highlight it because I view it as a, a step forward in beginning and energizing the conversation around how can we use archaeology as a useful tool of inquiry to study slavery at William and Mary. And this project specifically addressed that. Another report I wanted to highlight um, that specifically focuses on the history of enslaved people was born from excavations by Wim Carr again in 1999 and 2000. There, these excavations were in the Wren North Yard and the Wren South Yard, and they revealed high artifact densities of kitchen related materials in the North Yard, especially items such as bottle fragments, glassware, and animal bone. And the animal bone especially suggests activities of food processing and cooking. And you can see on the left here, I have a density map. You can see on this density map, it shows where these artifacts were most concentrated which is right to the Wren. If you're looking at the Wren building, it's to the right of it. Uh, the authors then compare this density map to several historical depictions of campus, one of them being this image on the right, which is a lithograph uh, from Thomas Millington in 1840. These maps reveal that to an onlooker, the focus would have been on the, the Wren ornamental garden, the large trees, and especially the monumental architecture, the buildings. However, the spaces where enslaved people and domestic workers moved around are quite hidden. So these authors use the spatial knowledge about the placement and the location of buildings, fences, and trees, as well as the, the location of where enslaved labor and domestic workers were concentrated to suggest that the college was intentionally concealing the activities of enslaved laborers from eyesight. And this kind of nicely segues into one of my own critiques that I have formed from working with these reports and getting more familiar with archaeology at William & Mary, and that's related to our fixation on and our prioritization of monumental architecture. We know so much about the Wren Building, 
And I have learned that many archeological projects on campus are devoted to learning more about the Wren, its construction, its rebuilding phases, its foundations, et cetera. And that is all great knowledge to have. I'm not saying that we don't need to have that knowledge. For one, there are processes of labor, power, and oppression that are forever attached to the Wren building because we know that enslaved men, women, and children moved around in its halls. So completely taking it out of the picture ignores the fact that enslaved people lived and worked there. But it does seem to me that there is a limit to how much we can learn about the enslaved population at William & Mary when we put the Wren building at the very center of our research questions. We know, as I just um, stated, we know enslaved people lived in the Wren and as well as the president's house, but they also lived around it. You can see in the map on the right that there are several outbuildings depicted on historic campus. Some are close to the Wren building, others are further spread out. There's also documentary evidence that links these outbuildings to enslaved peoples. So I'm asking moving forward, how can archeological research questions shift toward examining more deeply these spaces that exist around and in between historic campus buildings? Obviously that's where most excavations have taken place in the spaces between, but what I'm saying is that there's a different way we can approach these materials assemblages that kind of decenter the architecture from our questions. And this brings me to two areas of interest that I've come across, which are these subfloor pits and root cellars that have been found in the Wren North Yard and in the President's House parking lot. Subfloor pits and root cellars are archeological features thought to be associated with slave housing context, contexts or kitchens. The feature outlined in the picture here is thought to be one of those subfloor pits. And from this feature, there were 982 19th century artifacts uh, that, came, that came from this pit. And I cannot tell you right now because I haven't, I haven't done any analysis on them. So I can't tell you that they are 100% associated with enslaved peoples, but I do encourage a deeper material analysis, analysis of features like this because I believe they're a good starting point to get at these questions of how did enslaved people live and how did they move around? What materials did they use at William & Mary? This reorients research questions away from the monuments of historic campus and toward these less visible and less understood spaces. This may even allow us to broaden to, or to spatially extend what we conceptualize as historic campus because we know that these outbuildings existed beyond the boundary that the Wren, the Brafferton Indian School, and the President's House make up. Maybe we can even extend historic campus all the way back to the original 330 acre boundary line that goes back to the alumni house. Effectively, this transforms the way that we think of William & Mary as an archeological site. And to sum up my presentation, um, I know that the theme of this symposium and especially the theme of this panel is, is on gender and, and black women. However, I've kind of strayed from that intentionally because at this point I have not done any artifact analysis and that's what's gonna really paint us a clearer picture of gendered activities and gendered spaces in these among enslaved peoples. So the potential is all there, I, I'm sure of it. I'm just simply not there yet. My goal for this presentation and for my fellowship is to highlight this discrepancy between archeology span existing at William & Mary for about 90 years, yet only a handful of projects and published material that really takes on the history of enslavement. I do hope to encourage further material analysis with my work and future projects that directly investigate the material lives of enslaved peoples on campus. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and I'm also looking forward to any questions. Thank you, Caroline. Um, 
Uh, we regret that our third speaker uh, was not able to make this session today. So we're going to leap into the questions for Elsa and for Caroline. So it's my job as moderator to read the questions that have been coming into the, the chat. And um, uh, Elsa and Caroline, I invite you to, to both stay unmuted and to, to take turns answering and, and feel free to respond Elsa, if I ask a question to Caroline, feel free to add to an answer that you might have and, and vice versa. Um, okay, so um, questions. Um, a question, a couple questions here for Elsa. Um, were these persons' marriages acknowledged only in the church and not by law? Uh, yes, uh, mar enslaved people's marriages were never acknowledged by the law, and there were religious denominations that did not allow enslaved people to marry. In the case of the Catholic Church and the Jesuits, they did marry enslaved people, but I will not say that they respected uh, these marriages because in numerous occasions, even though they considered that families were sacred, they sold women and men who were married to different places thus separating families. Thank you. Um, and actually continuing in, in sort of the, the rituals of the Catholic Church, um, another question here. You mentioned the last rites being given to one of the enslaved women. Was there an anticipation that she would enter heaven as free or as enslaved? Now that's a great question. Uh, now, since around the 17th century, the uh, like Jesuit theologians started to have like debates about the nature of slavery and the nature of what would happen to enslaved people once they passed. Now, Jesuits believed that anyone that was enslaved was part of the body of Christ. They could go to heaven. They they had a soul. They had to debate these things, even though we might find them really uh, disgusting to even think about. And they justified enslavement as a way to cleanse your sins, either of this life or of a past life. You were marked. Therefore, once you had lived in slavery, you could ascend to heaven without being enslaved. That was the way that you could see, there's even sermons that I have read in which they talk about how slavery is a way in which your body is unburdening of sin by your suffering and that there would be a heaven in which you would not have to suffer. Um, and that actually answers, I think, maybe two of the next questions, which are, um, how did the Jesuits and other religions justify their actions? And um, did the church at Georgetown provide religious instruction for their enslaved persons? Well, in the case of like, uh, how did uh, like any Christian denomination justify enslavement? The majority of them used the Old Testament. And in particular, they used uh, the curse of Ham. Ham was one of so the sons of Noah. And Noah cursed his son, telling him that all of his descendants would be enslaved. So they used certain passages in scripture, particularly from the Old Testament, to justify enslavement and they participating in the enslavement of other human beings. And in turn, they used also sermons to justify their actions to the people that they were enslaving. Now, in the case of religious education, there are indications that at Georgetown, for example, uh, enslaved children received First communion that they received uh, confirmation. You know, adults that were enslaved were part of the congregation, so they did receive a, a religious education, but they were not taught how to read or write, for example. But many Jesuits did have like an active missionary life with the communities that they enslaved, because that was also one of the ways that they justified enslavement. We're enslaving them because they are infidels and we are bringing religion to them. Like this, there's not really twisted mental universe in which these priests inhabited. And those were the ways that they justified enslavement and also their treatment of the people they enslaved. And, and certainly, uh, you know, there's plenty of evidence that's not limited to the, to the Catholic Church that that 
that extends uh, across many, many denominations. Exactly, yes. Um, Caroline, um, could you talk a little bit about how um, the public uh, can view the archeological reports uh, attached to William and Mary, uh, especially uh, finding ways to, to ask questions about African-American history on campus? Uh, yeah, sure. So a lot of these reports are that, that I've collected and looked at, some of them are available online through, if you, you can go to the, the WIMCAR website, it's William and Mary Center for Archaeological Research. They have, they do have um, a page where they have some of their published reports that are available to read. Um, you can also, I believe the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, the VDHR, um, th th that's definitely a good resource to go to. However, I will say I did spend the better half of a year trying to locate these reports because, um, you know, I took on the task of, okay, let me, let me gather all information that we know about archaeology of William and Mary. And I thought that would be kind of a straightforward um, task. <laughs> Turns out it's not. Archaeologists can sometimes, um, you know, write things up and then and then just leave it somewhere um, undigitized. Uh, so some of the reports that I that I talked about here, I've digitized them uh, personally, and they exist in in like our Lemon Project shared vault almost. Uh, the goal, hopefully in the near future, is to get all of those into attached to a public facing website so that anyone and everyone can go in and access that information and and look up all of the material findings that um, have been found on campus. Um, and Elsa, I'll, I'll throw a, a documents question to you. Um, beyond the, the slave schedules of the 19th century, what documents are sources of names of slaves at Georgetown? Uh, sacramental records are one of the biggest sources of names and also of finding relations of enslaved people. Uh, the Jesuits gave sacraments from like baptism to like, marriage, first communion to the people that they enslaved. So some of the names that we have of these people are based on these sacramental records, which are like online at the Georgetown Slavery Archive. Other sources of names are actually censuses that the Jesuits themselves did at, on campus and at their plantations in distinct moments. And sales are also uh, good ways to find the names of people that were enslaved on campus. Um, another question for Caroline. Um, the excavation reports that you're talking about, did you include the uh, excavations from the site of the Bray School, uh, which I happen to know that report is not yet published. So, um, but it, is, is that represented in your statistics? Right, and so um, that, is a, that is a great question because those excavations are, are you know, incredibly relevant. Uh, but no, I did not include those reports in, in those statistics and in, in my findings, mostly because as Susan just mentioned, they're, they're not published yet. A lot of times um, between, there's, there's often like a lag between when a site is excavated and then when it gets published on. And because, I mean, I, I am technically an insider, but I'm not, I'm just kind of getting started with this research. So I haven't been able to get access to a lot of unpublished reports yet or, or even field notes. And that would be really great to know. Um, so no, I have not included in my analyses the excavations um, from the Bray School. Well, and it, I'll, I'll take a, 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 a commenter's prerogative here to, to add that, uh, you know, there's a very visible part of archaeology, which is the field work, but then there is a lot of work before a report gets finished that involves uh, cataloging artifacts, processing artifacts, doing statistical analysis of them. So there's a lot of archaeological work that's invisible, uh, and it, it's it's not always that someone's trying to hide something; it's that they're trying they're trying to get it done. Um, it, you know, while uh, while other things are also pressing. 
Um, so I have a question, actually, I, I'm gonna, uh, two questions here, I'm gonna throw to both of you. Um, the first is, um, what do we know about burial records, uh, locations and sites at, at both Georgetown and at William & Mary? Okay, well, I, could, I can start uh, with, with Georgetown. Now, in the case of burial records, a lot of burial records, especially from 18, 18 until 1860, you can find digitized and you can find them now in the Georgetown Slavery Archive. Uh, since when people are buried in a sacramental ground, according to like a uh, Catholic thought, you need to keep a record of it. The Jesuits did keep records of a lot of the people that they enslaved or that were enslaved in the neighborhood, but happened to be Catholic and were buried in one of their burial grounds. Now, one of these burial sites is actually at Georgetown University's campus. It is now underneath the science building. There's absolutely no type of like memorialization done. And one of my activities as the assistant curator of the Georgetown Slavery Archive is to put a memorial uh, to the people that I've identified that were enslaved. And I don't know if I could share you a, a picture of the memorial uh, just quickly so that you can see it. I've been putting this uh, this memorial with the names of 66 people that were enslaved and were buried in a site called the College Ground, which was a Catholic burial ground from 1818 to 1832 when it ran out of space uh, because of the cholera epidemic. So all of these people were buried in this site, which is now underneath a building called the Rice Science Building. And when the building was uh, started to construction in the 1950s, uh, Georgetown did move some bodies, uh, but only from the area of the cemetery that was actually for people that paid to be buried and not enslaved people. So I can assure you that <laughs> they did not move these bodies. Uh, there's very few documentation of any sort of archaeological work done after uh, construction. And actually, I'm going to stop the share now. Actually, when they were building a dorm recently in 2014-15 they actually found human remains again because this is the area of a cemetery but nothing has been done of it so that's why I've been putting up uh, this memorial I, I believe that it's very important to bring attention to the history of these burial grounds because sadly the inequalities and the injustices that these people lived during their lives follow them to their deaths and their descendants cannot go and visit them. Another burial site I'll quickly just add is also on Wisconsin Avenue. For those of you that know Washington, DC, uh, there is another burial ground there on Wisconsin in front of a Trader Joe's. Now that that site has uh, has been, uh, been, it's not underneath a building. It's still an active cemetery, but there is absolutely no sign that enslaved people are buried there. But at least 40 people that have that were enslaved were buried on Holy Root Cemetery. You can Google Holy Root Cemetery and you can find more information about that. So these are the two main sites in which you know people related to the Jesuits or Catholics that were enslaved in Washington, DC in the area of Georgetown were buried. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, yes, so in terms of an enslaved burial ground or burial records that indicate the locations or our site of enslaved people at William and Mary, I would say that that's something that's on the forefront of all of our minds and, and something that we all really wanna get at. I can speak, I can speak on, I, I read a report about the discovery of a number of enslaved peoples, um, I believe women and children actually, 10 to 12, I think, that were found at the um, college landing site, which is near campus, it's not on campus. I've also, um, through word of mouth and personal communication, have learned of um, some graves that were discovered near Merchant Square in Colonial Williamsburg that were thought to be um, um, an enslaved African family. However, those extend beyond the boundaries of 
um, William and Mary's campus. And that's what I've been really focusing on was what's hap what happened on campus. It's very, it's very possible that some of those that some of those individuals could have been linked to William and Mary, but um, we don't we don't really know that yet. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's been investigations to try to look for um, unmarked graves or unmarked burials near the edge near the edges of campus. But those um, that was in 2016, and I don't believe those didn't come up with anything. So, so yeah, I, I would say like that. That's kind of the burning question: is how can we take archaeology at William and Mary, move forward with it in productive ways, where maybe we can find an enslaved burial ground because because we really haven't yet. Well, and if if I can ask you to extend your question a little bit, there's there's another uh, uh, audience member who who actually would would like you to talk a little bit more about what we know about the early boundaries of William and Mary, uh, and how 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 those conditions make archaeological digs possible for research. What's built over and what's not. Do you have kind of a general statement about, uh, you know, his, the, the property that William and Mary owned historically and how the, the circumstances of it today? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so the original college tract of land was 330 acres. And a lot of that, I mean, the college still They've expanded on that, but none of that doesn't belong to the college anymore. Um, in terms of what's been built over, I mean, certainly academic buildings, um, the library, the athletic fields and stuff. So all of that does tend to make it difficult to conduct an extensive archeological survey of that original 330 acres. And unfortunately, for some of the buildings that went up before, I'd say the 80s, archeologists weren't really writing down specific findings um, or weren't conducting large scale excavations to prevent the destruction of cultural resources. Um, what I personally would like to know the most about, or what I'm most curious about is the sunken gardens because that was that sits right behind um, historic campus and those that was constructed during the depression era so in the 1930s and I I don't believe I think the the CCC the Civilian Conservation Corp might have some records on anything that was found while the sunken gardens were being constructed and you know literally dug out um, I haven't gotten access to those records yet. Um, that's that would definitely be an interesting research direction to go in. But um, yeah, I'll, just, I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you. Um, I I have a question um, that I want to throw to Elsa, um, and I'm I'm wondering if you have any way of have seen any way that the Jesuits acknowledged re reproductive labor by women as having val the same value as their labor doing laundry? Um, you know, what, what is, did, how are, how is their potential for, uh, for raising families for, you know, uh, unfortunately reproducing uh, numbers of, of enslaved people. Um, do, do you see any, any acknowledgement of, of reproductive labor as part of their economic value to the Jesuits? That's, that's a great question because I had, like that was one of my burning questions when I started to look into the archive, like how is it that did they acknowledge reproductive labor? However, what I've actually seen in the archive is that at some point they start even to see the reproduction, like the, the productive capabilities of women as a hindrance to their activities uh, because they 
do not like that women have to spend time raising children, that children can't go into the fields. So at some point, and I believe that this also follows what Jesuits did in other parts of the world, Jesuits did not like to have children in the plantations or mm -hmm. they tried to select just a number of elderly women to take care of children and everyone, even if you gave birth like a day before you would be sent to the fields. But in terms of then acknowledging the value of women and the reproductive capabilities, there's nothing in their writings except complaints about how women are. And I've seen lists and where there's the world useless and then a list of women. So they, they have uh, their ideas on gender are quite fascinating. And in some respects, they did not share uh, the same ideas that other planters in the South have in terms of like the value that a woman might have because she is in a reproductive period. No, and no matter if the woman was like 15 to 20 years old, she would be marked as useless sometimes in the like little censuses that the Jesuits did of their plantations. Um, so I'm going to ask last question here for, for each of you, um, and our audience members would like to know how many enslaved people are we talking about uh, documented at this point at Georgetown, at William and Mary, and um, what are movements toward reparations at each institution or at, on some other institutional level uh, with the knowledge we have? In the case of Georgetown's campus, I have found 75 different individuals that are named in the financial records in a period of 70 years. Most of the campus depended on hired and slave labor. So most of these people were actually not owned by the Jesuits, but by local slaveholders that used them to finance the education of their children. Now, in the case of the Jesuit plantations in Maryland, we're talking about a significant community that at some point was more than 300 people who ended up being sold to Louisiana in 1838. Now, the numbers like the aggregate since the Jesuits arrived in Maryland and made their turn to slavery, like in 1717 to up to 1860, we're talking about at least a thousand people that were enslaved by the Jesuits in Maryland. So it's a it's a big number, but for a lot of them, we don't have names. Now, because of the sale of 272 people in 1838, there's been like a movement towards reparations. I'm sure you've all heard in the news, you know, students uh, voting to establish fees. And just recently that the Jesuit order uh, promised that they're going to start fundraising money of at least $100 million to create some sort of a fund for the descendant community. Now, I don't know if they believe that that is reparations because the way that I conceive reparations might be differently than them, but there is a, a movement uh, and they have uh, in some points apologized for their participation in the slave trade and they're doing, they're starting. I believe that this is just the starter I would like to think because there's still much to do. Caroline? Yes, yeah, so the Lemon Project is is kind of constantly and actively still in the search for for names of enslaved peoples but at the moment we know of 180 enslaved individuals that either lived or worked at William and Mary from 1693 to 1865 and we're definitely as I said we're definitely still looking for more individuals at this time um, but we're at 180 right now and in terms of reparations, I mean, William and Mary has issued a formal apology. The, um, the Lemon Project, excuse me, is, is deeply involved and dedicated to community engagement with, with descendant communities and the African-American community in Williamsburg. Um, we are also, many of you may be familiar with this, we are also working on the Memorial to the Enslaved which is going to be put on historic campus, um, kind of between the Brafferton and the Wren building. And that is, that is in the process and the design for that 
is it's called Hearth and where we're going to display the names of enslaved peoples as we find them in our research. Thank you both so much. Uh, you, you've both highlighted the challenges of institutional records that allow us to see the work of women, but just begin to suggest the things that we want to know about their actual lives. Uh, and all these questions of institutions as discoverers and keepers of these records and, and, and our responsibility to, to this knowledge now that we have it. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I enjoyed both of your papers and uh, I look forward to the rest of the, the Lemon Symposium. Yes, thanks to everyone for coming. Well, thank you, everyone.